As far back as I can remember, I have conceptualized the yearly calendar as a circle. The winter months are situated at the bottom, and the summer months are at the top. So when I hear reference to the month of April, for example, I think of it as positioned off to the left of a circle. Any reference to the zodiac does the same kind of thing. Gemini, up there at 11 o'clock on the circle. How long is the day relative to the night? Just look at where you are on the circle. Near the top, long hours of daylight. Near the bottom, long hours of darkness. This is a kind of rough and ready automatic conception for me. In fact, I was surprised to learn more recently that this is totally different from how other people I've spoken to think about the months. I think I learned this way of thinking from a calendar that was on the wall in my house as a kid. I don't think it was innate. But the immediacy of this sense of a yearly circle makes me think of what it must be like to have synesthesia. This is the topic I want to ponder today, synesthesia the crossing over of one kind of sense or stimulus onto another modality. To start, I'll relate some discussions on drug-related experiences of synesthesia. Oliver Sacks has a chapter in his book, Hallucinations, on the topic of altered states. He writes, quote, The effects of cannabis, mescaline, LSD, and other hallucinogenic drugs have an immense range and variety, yet certain categories of perceptual distortion and hallucinatory experience may to some extent be regarded as typical of the brain's responses to such drugs. The experience of color is often heightened, sometimes to an unearthly level as Weir, Mitchell, Huxley, and Breslau all observed. There may be sudden changes in orientation and striking alterations of apparent size. There may be micropsia or Lilliputian vision, or there may be gigantism, macropsia. There may be exaggerations or diminutions of depth and perspective, or exaggerations of stereo vision, or even stereo hallucinations, seeing three-dimensional depth and solidity in a flat picture." Unquote. He goes on, quote, The perceptual transformations and hallucinations induced by mescaline, LSD, and other hallucinogens are predominantly, but not exclusively, visual. There may be enhancements or distortion or hallucinations of taste and smell, touch and hearing, or there may be fusions of the senses, a sort of temporary synesthesia, the smell of a low B-flat, the sound of green, as Breslau put it. Such coalescences or associations and their presumed neural basis are creations of the moment. In this way, they are quite different from true synesthesia, a congenital and often familial condition where there are fixed sensory equivalences that last a lifetime." Unquote. As it turns out, Synesthesia is often described in the context of psychotropic drug experiences. In his book, How to Change Your Mind, Michael Pollan describes research on psilocybin by Robin Carhart Harris and his colleagues at Imperial College in London. The results suggest interesting changes in the brain's functional integration under the influence of hallucinogenic drugs. These may provide clues as to the neural basis of synesthesia. Pollan writes, quote, the various scanning technologies that the Imperial College Lab used to map the tripping brain showed that the specialized neural networks of the brain, such as the default mode network and visual processing system, each become disintegrated while the brain as a whole becomes more integrated as new connections spring up among regions that ordinarily kept mainly to themselves or were linked only via the hub of the default mode network. Put another way, the various networks of the brain became less specialized. Distinct networks became less distinct under the drug, Carhart Harris and his colleagues wrote, implying that they communicate more openly with other brain networks. The brain operates with greater flexibility and interconnectedness under hallucinogens. In a 2014 paper published in the Journal of the Royal Society Interface, the Imperial College team demonstrated how the usual lines of communications within the brain are radically reorganized when the default mode network goes offline and the tide of entropy is allowed to rise. Using a scanning technique called magnetoencephalography, which maps electrical activity in the brain, the authors produced a map of the brain's internal communications during normal waking consciousness and after an injection of psilocybin." Unquote. Pollan describes a figure, which appears in the book, contrasting normal brain connectivity to that with psilocybin. And he writes, quote, When the brain operates under the influence of psilocybin, as shown on the right, thousands of new connections form, 
linking far-flung brain regions that during normal waking consciousness don't exchange much information. In effect, traffic is rerouted from a relatively small number of interstate highways onto myriad smaller roads, linking a great many more destinations. The brain appears to become less specialized and more globally interconnected, with considerably more intercourse or crosstalk among its various neighbors. There are several ways this temporary rewiring of the brain may affect mental experience. When the memory and emotion centers are allowed to communicate directly with the visual processing centers, it's possible our wishes and fears, prejudices and emotions begin to inform what we see, a hallmark of primary consciousness and a recipe for magical thinking. Likewise, the establishment of new linkages across brain systems can give rise to synesthesia, as when sense information gets cross-wired so that colors become sounds or sounds become tactile." Unquote. Of course, we know that there are individuals known as synesthetes who have persistent crossover between different sensory modalities. I found a review article written by Edward Hubbard and V.S. Ramachandran. You may know Ramachandran from his popular books, notably Phantoms in the Brain, which is about his studies on phantom limb. Hubbard and Ramachandran write, quote, Synesthesia is a relatively rare condition in which sensory stimuli cause unusual additional experiences. These additional experiences often occur between modalities, such as seeing colors while listening to music, or feeling tactile shapes while tasting foods. One of the most common and intensely studied forms of synesthesia is grapheme color synesthesia, in which viewing letters or numbers elicits the experience of colors. For our synesthete JAC, looking at the letter E will elicit the experience of a red photism or colored overlay, while viewing an O elicits a blue percept. Other synesthetes report that they do not actually see these colored photisms, but rather just know that a particular letter is a particular color whereas still others report experiencing specific colors, but say that the color is experienced somewhere within their mind's eye." Unquote. In a section covering cognitive studies, they write, quote, With modified Stroop interference paradigms, recent research has shown that synesthesia is automatic and perhaps obligatory. In the standard Stroop paradigm, color names are presented in colored ink, such as the word red, printed in either red or green, congruent or incongruent, respectively. Responses in the incongruent condition are typically much slower than in the congruent condition. Because the task has nothing to do with reading the word, the interference shows that reading the word is automatic. Similarly, in the synesthetic Stroop paradigm, graphemes are presented in either congruent or incongruent ink colors for each synesthete. For a synesthete who sees seven as yellow, a seven presented in yellow would be congruent and a seven presented in any other color would be incongruent. The consistent finding that synesthetes are slower in the incongruent condition than in the congruent condition demonstrates that synesthetic colors are automatic and not under voluntary control. Subsequent research has shown that synesthetic Stroop interference can be induced simply by thinking about or imagining the eliciting stimulus when it is the solution to a math problem and can be eliminated by masking the target grapheme before presenting a colored grapheme." Unquote. So what is going on in the brain that accounts for synesthesia? I'll share one more small section with you, a proposal that cross-activation occurs between cortical regions. The authors write, quote, Based on the fact that the visual word form area lies adjacent to color processing region HB4, we have proposed that grapheme color synesthesia may arise from direct cross-activation between these adjacent brain regions. Our hypothesis builds on previous work suggesting that phantom limb sensations may arise through cortical reorganization in amputees. Crucially, these cortical-to-cortical -cortical connections led to systematic perceptual experiences of having the missing limb stimulated through stimulation of the still-present facial nerves, and these novel perceptual experiences were reproducible and involuntary. We suggest that synesthesia arises through a mechanism of cross-activation, similar to that observed in phantom limb patients, and this cross-activation leads to reproducible, involuntary, systematic perceptual experiences." Unquote. It seems likely that synesthesia has different causes, resulting in the variety of types that have been discovered. It's useful to me to characterize them into at least two forms, a conceptual form and a perceptual form. In the case of my circular conception of the calendar, this is a ki kind of like conceptual synesthesia. I automatically think of a shape whenever a month or season comes up, but I am not a synesthete. I learned an association and it stuck. 
I have a kind of experience, but it is really of a common sort, like a certain word putting a song in your head. In fact, something like this is behind all associational learning. We learn to put things together that are otherwise unrelated. This is what we do when we learn to read, for example. There is nothing intrinsic about the shape of the letter L that ought to bring up the name L or the sound LA. We learned it and we are forever stuck with it. It is automatic. The shape of the number seven brings up both the name, seven, and the quantity, seven. But these are conceptual examples, not perceptual ones. What about perceptions? Donald Hoffman writes in The Case Against Reality, quote, One reason we're sure we see reality and not just an interface is that we're sure others see things pretty much the way we do. Suppose I say to you, that red tomato on the table looks ripe and ready to eat, and you agree. I naturally assume that your perceptions are the same as mine, and indeed the same as objective reality. Why else would we agree? Surely it's because we accurately perceive the same reality. But even if we agree in conversation, we may disagree dramatically in perception. 4% of humans are synesthetes, who live in perceptual worlds quite foreign to the rest of us. Unquote. He goes on, quote, Colors and chromatures appear in a wide variety of synesthesias. They can be triggered by music, printed letters, printed numbers, days of the week, months of the year, emotions, pains, odors, tastes, and even personalities. In grapheme color synesthesia, each symbol for a letter or number is seen as having a color. For instance, A might look red, B might look green, and so on through the entire alphabet. In gustatory tactile synesthesia, each taste has an associated shape in three dimensions that can be felt by the hands." Unquote. Hoffman shares a number of strange and interesting examples, and he points out that in many synesthetes, the experiences they have are not imaginary or conceptual, but actual perceptions, in his words, as immediate and compelling as smashing your thumb with a hammer. This begs the question, what experience should one have when smashing one's thumb with a hammer? or when in the presence of burning frankincense, or when looking at printed letters. We are evolved creatures, and we have evolved brain systems for perceiving physical events. If smashing the thumb with a hammer were harmless to our form of organism, we would not be experiencing pain from such a stimulus. If smashing your thumb with a hammer was a source of nutrition, it would probably be a tasty and satisfying occurrence. Way back in episode 3, I made an argument that consciousness must be functional, not epiphenomenal. I said the following. Presumably, either consciousness serves an adaptive function or it is a side effect of some brain process that is adaptive. In either case, natural selection seizes upon the adaptive advantage and creatures such as us wind up with consciousness. What breaks this impasse for me is a deeper evaluation of what it is like to be me, a closer inspection of my qualia. I perceive certain colors and shapes in my visual scenes, and those colors and shapes seem to be consistent from one experience of a visual kind to another. So if I see my car in the driveway today, it looks to me like my car yesterday. This consistency of visual perception enables me to comprehend my surroundings. Of course, the human organism needs to respond appropriately to the physical features of its environment. But if I am no more than a witness, then it is unnecessary and superfluous that I should have a coherent understanding of anything. The basic observation extends to all kinds of perceptions, the way certain foods taste compared to others, the way certain objects feel in my hands, or textures feel upon my skin, the sound of a certain voice or other common things encountered during the day. So stimuli presented to the receptor systems of the physical brain produce consistent effects in my mind. That would be the case even if consciousness were epiphenomenal, so long as similar neuronal network activities produce similar qualia in me. That seems plausible, but what about qualia like pain and pleasure? If the effect on my mind is of no consequence to this animal, it seems a remarkable coincidence that all of the things that are pleasing to me are favored in the behavior of the animal I accompany, while all of the things that are displeasing to me are avoided. Imagine being the impotent consciousness of a person who eats the foods that you hate, surrounds himself with sounds and smells that drive you to distraction vigorously pursues sexual congress with mates that you find unattractive and otherwise behaves in a manner that causes you discomfort and distress all day. In the epiphenomenal case, it would make no difference. Any number of counterexamples can be summoned in contrast to this. Human organisms like salt, fat, and sugar, alcohol, sex, compliments, and the esteem of other humans. So do I. I like all of those things. When this human animal behaves in a manner that achieves its evolutionarily determined objectives, I experience rewarding qualia. 
It feels good to me when this animal behaves in certain ways or when things that are good for this animal occur. By contrast, injury or illness or neglect or social isolation, all clearly against the evolutionary interest of the animal, each are accompanied by unpleasant and horrible qualia for me. If qualia are produced as an arbitrary side effect of neuronal network activities, why aren't the qualia arbitrary? Parsimony requires me to conclude that my consciousness is not an epiphenomenon. The alternative seems a lot less plausible. Suppose, for example, that the brain processing that takes incoming data streams and produces appropriate behavior must produce qualia as a side effect. This would amount to a functionalist description of brain processing that is essentially algorithmic, but with a physics that produces subjective experiences. The qualia produced might be consistent from instance to instance of a similar kind of brain processing, but they could be like anything at all that happened to result from the algorithm being run. One advantage of color vision is the pop-out effect that is well demonstrated in visual search tests. If you are presented with a field of black numbers against a white background, say a bunch of threes and a single five, the five does not pop out of the field. The more threes there are, the longer it will take to find the five. But if the threes are yellow and the five is red, you will notice it immediately. And in that case, having more and more yellow threes will make no difference in your spotting the red five. We might have evolved this capacity in order to distinguish ripe fruit. Imagine a troop of monkeys having to climb up into each tree and investigate its fruit to know whether it is ready. They would use a lot of time and energy to get up into the branches and squeeze the fruit, sniff it, and so on. A real advantage would go to the troop of monkeys who can easily see the quality of the fruit in the trees around them. Synesthetes who perceive colors in accordance with numbers have been tested in visual search paradigms. Paul Mary et al. showed that such synesthetes can find a target number in a field of distractors significantly faster than controls. Apparently, this advantage depended on the subject experiencing very different colors with the numbers presented them. So finding a two experienced as blue among fives experienced as red is relatively easy compared to finding a six in a field of eights if the subject perceives them as different shades of the same color, say green. It is clear that the contents of consciousness take the forms they do in order to be of use to us, as organisms. In fact, this is the foundation from which Donald Hoffman makes his argument against physical reality. Perception is not a copy of reality. So what can we learn from hallucinogenic experiences and from studies of synesthetic cognition? For one thing, these cases provide us with evidence that brain functions produce qualia, and so, different brain functions, either altered by molecules from fungus, by genetic differences, or by learned associations, should be expected to produce different qualia. In my experience with cannabis or psilocybin, I have felt alterations of time, texture, color, proportions, and so on. I've heard alterations of sound and the complexity of music. I've felt somatic differences in my body. I've experienced altered moods, creativity, and thinking processes. Granted, I've never been blasted to the upside down on DMT. My experiences are pretty limited. But in general, it seems that the alterations I've experienced are in degree rather than in kind. I've never seen a person who was not there, but I've seen the facial features of a person take on strange new characteristics. I've seen geometrical shapes manifest in the surface texture of an object, but they were not new geometric shapes outside of ordinary spatial rules, and the surfaces upon which they presented were real surfaces. This is what would be expected if the firing activities of my cerebral cortex were changed from what I'm used to in normal life. Functional architecture, but not structural architecture, was altered by the drug. What occurs in genuine synesthesia should be a cross-communication between normal brain regions. After all, the subjects have not told us that they experience something altogether unexplainable when they hear sounds or see graphemes. They tell us that they see colors or feel shapes. These are not new sensory modalities, but normal human ones. Why do we see things as we do? Why are these the colors I see? These the textures I feel and the musical notes I hear. Why don't I hear colors? In all probability, the isolation of specialized modalities for seeing colors and hearing sounds have been preferentially selected by nature. The phenomenology of these experiences could, at least in part, be an accident of the human lineage. Imagine if all human beings had a color to number synesthesia. Our science would have to explain these colors. We might be confused into believing of our world that the number 19 is mustard yellow. But by the same logic, how might we be confused now? 
Perhaps our notions of space and time are mixed up by the cerebral structures we have evolved to guide us through our environment. Perhaps what we think of as beautiful or even ethical is not a feature of the world, but only of us. Perhaps we go around with the misguided notion that the grass is green and the sky is blue. Thank you.